Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to my channel. My name is Paul, the Canadian Snowman, here with the finale of Thomas Cochran. I know it's been some time. Sorry, guys, had to have some family here visiting. You know, mother of my kids was here visiting for the week, so you know, having some family time and all that good stuff. And heck, my glasses are off, so now you can see a reflection of my light in my face because my eyes have been bugging me, my contacts have been bugging me, so instead of wearing my contacts, I'm wearing my glasses, so that's what's up with that. Uh, but anyways, guys, welcome back. Uh, yeah, what a, man, I'm trying to remember where this left off because it's been a while now. Uh, you know, so basically, I mean, Thomas is, he got, he won the war, you know, and but now... You know, the guy who took charge now is kind of taking it back to where it already came from. Uh, man, honestly, guys, I'm trying to remember. The, you know, Sheila, here we go. We're going to go back and we're going to kind of go over. We did, da, 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 da. Exactly, exactly. They beat the Spanish. Chile beat the Spanish. In, uh, but this guy, Jose, you know, kind of wants to be their kind of like kingpin now and take over everything, which is what the which is what they were trying to prevent to begin with. And it looks like, I think Cochrane's probably just going to have enough of this and take off. I'm assuming, I don't know, I'm not sure. But anyways, yeah, we're going to jump right into this and check it out. This is, this. Or there is no episode for this, so we, you guys suggested I start from this point, I believe. So we're starting from this point. But anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe if you haven't yet. And if this is your first time watching me, definitely go check out the beginning of the series. Amazing series. You won't be disappointed. And we're going to start with the last leg here. But following their victory, the rifts between them had begun to grow. San Martin had essentially established himself as a dictator, which he saw as a pragmatic necessity. The war had left Peru in chaos, and a heavy hand was needed to prevent widespread looting food shortages, and general anarchy. Yeah, he wants to be a dictator. He just basically sat on the sidelines, wait for Cochrane to do everything, so he can just swoop in and take, you know, the winning spoils, you know? Cochrane, however, saw San Martin as a traitor who had betrayed his oath to establish a liberal democracy in lands freed from Spain. In his eyes, Peru had simply traded one absolute tyrant for another. It didn't help that Cochrane and his crew had not been properly paid by San Martin, who argued that it was Chilean responsibility to do so, not Peru's. The Scotsman resolved this in typical Cochrane fashion, by tracking, boarding and looting a schooner transporting the state oh, treasury yeah. in Peru, and, and using the funds to pay himself and his sailors exactly what they were owed. Naturally, right. this caused a public outcry, and Cochrane quickly went from war hero to dangerous wild card in the eyes of the Peruvian people. His uncompromising idealism, stubbornness, and complete lack of discretion had. No! had alienated him from the very government he had literally just helped create. Cochrane returned to Valparaiso where the local Chileans still held him in high regard. It was there, in November of 1822, that the Sea Wolf received a letter from Juan Antonio Correa de Camera, a Brazilian agent operating out of Buenos Aires. It was a tantalizing proposition. Cochrane was being offered command of the Brazilian Navy. At first, he didn't intend to accept, but civil strife was brewing in Chile, and the Scotsman had no intention of getting involved. With his mind made up, he addressed the Chilean people with a fiery oration. Chilenos, my fellow countrymen, you know that independence is purchased at the point of a bayonet. Also know that liberty is founded on good faith and on the laws of honor, and that those who infringe upon these are your only enemies. With that, he sailed away from the country he had helped liberate, never to return. Much like the Spanish side of South America, the nation of Brazil was currently embroiled in an independent struggle against its own colonial father, Portugal. Although as far as revolutionary wars go, this one was unique. In 1807, Napoleon's armies had overrun the Portuguese kingdom, forcing its royal family to flee to their wealthiest colony across oh, the yeah. Atlantic. During this period, Brazil had become the de facto capital of the Portuguese Empire, 
and as such its people were afforded the highest status and privileges. In 1815, Napoleon had been defeated, and Portugal's ruling family was called upon to return to their newly liberated mother country. King Zhou IV went home, leaving his son Pedro to rule Brazil on his behalf. King Zhuo soon began rolling back the privileges the aristocracy of Brazil had been enjoying, reverting its status back to a subordinate colony. But the Brazilians had had a taste of liberty, and now called for rebellion. It would be an unlikely man that would rise to lead the revolution, the young prince, Pedro. Despite being heir to the throne of Portugal, he had spent most of his life in Brazil and cared deeply for his adopted homeland. So Pedro made the slightly unorthodox move of seceding from his own royal line, declaring independence or death for Brazil. Before That's amazing, man, like, because... He didn't have to do this. He was very wealthy, well off, and he was going to be like king of Portugal one day. But instead, the land that basically he grew up in and knew the most, you know, and over all his probably all his friends and all the family are down over here. Uh, he wants to make it his own and make it the best for his people over here because he considers Brazil his people. And so I, I think that that just makes me like this guy already. You know, the fact that he's doing this. So awesome stuff. Before long, he was crowned as the new nation's first emperor. In the spring of 1823, Cochrane arrived in Rio de Janeiro. By then, the young Emperor Pedro had more or less secured the independence of the southern half of his realm, but the Portuguese still remained in control of the northern regions of Bahia and Maranhão. Cochrane received a brief audience with the Emperor, who accompanied him to survey the ships that would be under his command. It was a modest but functioning navy, consisting of three frigates, two corvettes, three brigs, and a handful of schooners. Cochrane's flagship was the fleet's only ship of the line, a 64-gunner named Pedro Primiero. In April, Cochrane was deployed northwards for the first time. His initial target was the seaport of Salvador, capital of the... I'm already... I'm, Cochrane and the Prince, two guys I really like, and they're going for it. And I'm all for this man, gung-ho province of Bahia, and the most powerful stronghold in Brazil which was still in Portuguese hands. The city was currently besieged on the landward side by the forces of Emperor Pedro, so Cochrane blockaded the harbour with five of his ships to prevent the city being resupplied by sea. The Sea Wolf knew that the reliability of his crew was tenuous at best. During colonial times, Brazilians had been shunted from maritime jobs in favor of Portuguese-born sailors, so the new empire faced a severe lack of reliable mariners. Cochrane's ships were manned primarily by English and American mercenaries, African freedmen recently liberated from slavery, and Portuguese nationals who were poorly paid and treated with suspicion. Wow. Cochrane knew he could depend on the Anglophones, and the Africans were a wild card, but the disgruntled Portuguese labourers were highly untrustworthy. Hmm. He didn't have much time to address his misgivings, as on the 4th of May, a squadron of 13 Portuguese warships appeared on the horizon, uh -oh. intent to relieve the naval blockade of Salvador. As usual, Cochrane was outnumbered two to one. Equally as usual, the Sea Wolf's answer to this dilemma was to abandon all caution and charge headlong into the enemy. As the Portuguese fleet hastily arranged themselves into a line of battle, the Pedro Primiero barreled in between their formation, isolating four Portuguese vessels from the main body of their fleet. Immediately, Cochrane sent a flag signal to the rest of the ships to descend upon the isolated enemy vessels. But disaster struck. The disgruntled Portuguese aboard the Brazilian ships had decided that since their pay was so meagre, they may as well revert their loyalties back to their mother country. Wow. They refused to engage in battle, and Pedro Primiero was left to fight the entire enemy fleet alone. To make a dire situation worse... I mean, obviously, that was probably the plan from the get-go. Not, it's not like they just made that plan right when they're about to go into battle. I mean, uh, that makes you mad, man. Jeez, just do your job. <sighs> was left to fight the entire enemy fleet alone. To make a dire situation worse, Cochrane soon found that there were saboteurs aboard his own ship. Two Portuguese laborers had imprisoned the Pedro Primiero's powder monkeys below deck, 
preventing crucial gunpowder from being transported to the gun decks and rendering his ship unable to effectively return fire into the enemy. The conspirators were captured, but even Cochrane had to admit that there was no way he could earn any victory out of this humiliation. No. The Sea Wolf was forced to order a hasty retreat after what had been a humbling and unceremonious defeat. Following this major setback, Cochrane drastically rearranged the personnel in his fleet. The Englishmen, Americans, loyal Brazilians and Black Marines were all concentrated aboard his flagship and two frigates. It would be with this greatly reduced but overall more reliable fleet that Cochrane would proceed with the war. On the night of June 12th, Cochrane disguised the Pedro... What happened to the other guys? Did they get their ships back from the other the ones that defected, you know, the Portuguese ones that didn't want to fight? Did they get those ships back? Or did they just take off into the sunset? I mean, you could probably shoot those guys dead for not doing what they're supposed to do, right? Like hang them or something? Jeez. Pedro Primiero as an English merchant ship and sailed into Salvador Harbor performing reconnaissance in order to plan an attack using an old but reliable trick of his, fire ships. Cochrane's presence was soon discovered, but it worked in his favor. The citizens of Salvador were already exhausted from a year of being besieged, and when they found out it was the Sea Wolf himself at their seaward gate, they became gripped in terror, their minds taken by whatever crazy plan the infamous Scotsman had up his sleeve. The townsfolk had lost all desire to continue the fight and pleaded with the Portuguese governor to finally abandon the coastal stronghold. On July 7th, 1823, the Portuguese garrison assembled into a convoy of ships and left Bahia for good, sailing back to their mother country aboard nice. 17 warships and 75 transport vessels. We can only imagine what sort of sinister grin might have creeped upon Cochrane's lips as his prey exposed themselves on the open ocean. Before long, he unfurled his flagship sails and descended upon the fleeing Portuguese like a wolf upon a flock of sheep. Within months, Cochrane had all but eviscerated King Joao's navy, relentlessly pursuing them across the Atlantic, isolating and picking off enemy warships one by one with only three vessels at his command. In total, the Scotsman and his subordinates had captured over 30 Portuguese ships and taken over 2,000 enemy soldiers prisoner. Following the oh my god, I can't. I guess they. I guess their ships are just faster, or they're just uh, ships are faster, better crew to be able. I, I guess that, and I guess that's a long sail across the sea, so he had a lot of time. I suppose to kind of like like every day getting a handful of those ships and just taking them over him. They're I wonder if they steal some of those ships, you think maybe? You know, I guess they didn't really have the crew to kind of just steal a bunch of ships and bring them back to Brazil. But wow, he just waited till they all kind of came out and just one by one like dominoes, just like that, and took out all those ships. Wow. That dude is lethal, man. This and taken over 2,000 enemy soldiers prisoner. Following this utter devastation of Portuguese sea power, Cochrane proceeded to São Luís, the capital of the province of Maranhão. With only his flagship, he boldly sailed within range of the town's guns and sent his captain ashore to treat with the local commandant. Cochrane's message was simple. Bahia had been liberated, the Portuguese fleet had been destroyed, and a massive Brazilian fleet was on its way descending down upon Maranhão. Yeah. This was a huge bluff since no such Brazilian fleet existed. Nevertheless, the Portuguese garrison swallowed the bait, hook, line and sinker. The next day, the local junta and the town bishop came aboard the Pedro Primeiro, forsaking Portugal and swearing allegiance to the Brazilian emperor. Cochrane's men promptly took total control of the town, seized all its munitions and commandeered all the ships in its harbour. Cochrane returned to Rio in 1824, where he once more received a hero's welcome and was granted the non-hereditary title of Marquis of Maranhão by Emperor Pedro. That same year, a new rebel movement emerged in the province of Pernambuco, led by wealthy landowners who opposed the Brazilian Emperor's liberal reforms. Cochrane sailed north once more and helped to quickly crush the rebellion. At this point, the Sea Wolf had cemented himself as an eternal hero in the ethnogenesis of Brazilian nationhood, 
much like he had done in Chile and Peru. Unfortunately, Cochrane had developed a nasty little habit of becoming a nation's most celebrated war hero, only to immediately alienate said nation's government with his bullheadedness, and this Brazilian episode would end much like his Spanish-American escapades did. Throughout the revolution, Emperor Pedro's government had insisted on a policy of reconciliation with the former Portuguese landowners still living in Brazil, returning the wealth and property seized during the war to their original owners. This was an affront to Cochrane, who had seized the equivalent of some 12 million modern US dollars worth of booty during his time in Brazil, and insisted that he was owed at least one-eighth of the total take, as was proper. This boiled over in 1825, when Cochrane once more took his payment into his own hands, sacking Brazilian merchant ships anchored at São Luís do Maranhão and making off with the public funds in their holds. I mean, uh, you got the man just did like almost almost single-handedly like one Brazil for you, and you don't think he deserves? I mean, you deserve every basically. Cochrane deserved anything he wants because of what he did. I mean, that was invaluable what he did uh, for the prince there, the emperor. So the fact that they're trying to shortchange him, I, I think is just ridiculous. I mean, give him his money, let him go on his way and just be happy that you got exactly what you hired him to do. And I don't, I don't blame Cochrane for taking the money, man. I mean, I know it's the, the people's money there, but you know, he's got to get paid. You know, he didn't do it for free. Outraged, the Brazilian government demanded that the Scotsman return to Rio, but Cochrane had absconded aboard a frigate, and after a seven-year absence, made his way back home to Britain. Wow. But as it turned out, Cochrane's homecoming tour would be brief, as once more a new nation was calling for his aid. While the people and culture of Greece were ancient, its modern nation was very new and forged in rebellion. After nearly four centuries of Ottoman rule, the Greeks in the Ottoman Empire had risen up in 1821 and had been fighting a desperate war of survival ever since. The Greek struggle had evoked sympathy across Western Europe. Many saw the rebellion as a righteous holy war against their Turkish oppressors. Meanwhile, the educated elites of Western Europe had gobbled up classic Greek literature since the advent of the Renaissance and called upon their governments to help liberate the land of Socrates, Sophocles, Euripides and Demosthenes. All of this was very tantalizing to Cochrane, who despite being over 50, still craved action, adventure, fame and glory. After the Greek committee in London sent the legendary Seawolf a letter asking him to assume command of the Hellenic navy, he readily agreed. However, there were a few wrinkles to iron out first. Having felt cheated out of his pay in Peru and Brazil, Cochrane demanded an upfront payment of £37,000 from the Greeks, an exorbitantly high sum. He also insisted that a fleet of steam-powered warships be built for the war effort. Steam-powered vehicles were still a brand new invention in the 1820s, but Cochrane had long been an eager supporter of the technology. However, due to incompetence in the production line, None of Cochrane's commissioned steamships were completed fast enough to influence the Greek war effort, and the delay they caused in Cochrane's deployment cost the Greek revolutionaries heavily in time and resources. On March 17, 1827, Cochrane finally arrived in Poros. By then, the rebellion was in dire straits. The Greek leaders mounting the resistance had descended into vicious infighting while the Turks' Egyptian allies were ravaging the Peloponnese in a devastating invasion. Things did quickly turn around the moment Cochrane stepped ashore. The Sea Wolf was legendary. By now, everyone was well aware of his track record against Napoleon and across South America. His mere presence was a massive boost to Greek morale, and he quickly used his clout to help unite the feuding Greek generals, who were finally able to agree on one man to lead them the statesman Ioannis Kapodistrias. Unfortunately, the rest of Cochrane's endeavours in Greece went rather poorly. He had never developed a rapport with his Greek troops the way he had earned the loyalty of those of Chile and Brazil. He considered the Hellenes in his crew poorly trained and mightily undisciplined. In reality, 
the Chilean and Brazilian navies had been pretty much non-existent before Cochrane's arrival, allowing him to create a hierarchy and military doctrine from the ground up. Meanwhile, the makeshift Greek navy had enjoyed much success before Cochrane took command of them, forcing the Sea Wolf to adapt to a pre-existing style of irregular naval warfare he was not used to. On the 5th of... I mean, I can understand that because it goes for work as well. You know, if you hire someone new who's never done a position before, you can teach them the exact right way things are supposed to be done. And those people are most likely going to do it that way. But if you end up uh, like joining a team who's already, you know, been working there a while and they know all the shortcuts and all the ins and outs and, how, and they're kind of lazy and what they do, uh, it's very hard to change, you know, their thinking and stuff like that, you know. It's like you can't teach, you know, old dog new tricks kind of thing. And so I, I definitely understand, like, where he's coming from as far as these guys, they want to still keep, you know, they want to work the same way they've been working the whole time. They don't want to change, you know. What they've been doing has been working, I guess, so they don't, why would they want to change, so. Makes it really a lot harder for him. ...existing style of irregular naval warfare he was not used to. On the 5th of May, 1827, an attempt to liberate Athens by laying siege to the Acropolis ended in disaster, largely because Cochrane couldn't stop quarrelling with his fellow Briton Richard Church, the man who had been appointed to lead the Greek army. Their collective failure to execute a successful invasion resulted in the deaths of thousands of Greeks, from that point on, Cochrane no longer played a major role in the Greek struggle for independence, mm. although his participation in the war did indirectly lead to the intervention of the great powers of Britain, France and Russia, who defeated a Turco-Egyptian fleet at Navarino in 1828, securing the independence of southern Greece. Okay. Nevertheless, the Sea Wolf's legacy in Hellas is considered a stay in an otherwise remarkable naval career. It would take Cochrane several years to recover from his failures in the Peloponnese, as he grappled with his own shattered sense of self-worth. His fighting days were now over. Over the years, the British Parliament that had originally driven him from his homeland had begun to recognise his value once more, slowly becoming sympathetic to him. On May 2nd, 1832, Cochrane was finally pardoned for the stock fraud and was reinstated as an officer of the Royal Navy of Great Britain, and all the honours he had earned in the Napoleonic War were returned. Cochrane was promoted to Rear Admiral of the British Navy. He never saw direct combat again, living his days in semi-retirement, where he continued his experiments with modern technology, pouring funds into the continued research and development of steam-powered engines. One of Cochrane's many legacies today is that of a pioneer of military technology, and he is widely considered to be one of the more influential men who helped Britain transition from the age of sail into the age of steam. In 1860, an elderly sea wolf wrote an extensive autobiography of his life and adventures, the same tome we've referred to throughout this series. That same year, his health began to deteriorate, and on the 31st of October, while undergoing a risky surgery for kidney stones, he passed away at the age of 85. Aww. The legacy of the Sea Wolf still casts a shadow upon the nations for whom he served. In Britain, he is considered perhaps the single most daring commander of the Age of Sail, yeah. and his adventures have directly inspired famous naval fiction such as the Horatio Hornblower series as well as Master and Commander. In Chile, six vessels, Dozens of streets and a small town all bear his name. One I just want to say Master and Commander is an amazing movie. If you haven't seen Master and Commander, check it out. Six vessels, dozens of streets and a small town all bear his name. While a striking monument in Valparaiso has immortalized his role in the freedom of the country. Each year in May, representatives of the Chilean Navy hold a wreath laying ceremony at his grave. Many in Peru and Brazil today still honor Cochrane's crucial role in the liberation of their nations. Thus ends our video on Thomas Cochrane, but we always have more stories to tell. Well, there you got it, guys, man. We finally did it. Thomas Cochrane, craziest sea captain. We finally finished it. Uh, done it, finished it, all that good stuff. Wow. I mean... The stuff he's done through his entire life, it's just crazy, you know, being Napoleon, going and 
liberating Chile, then go and do the same thing for Brazil and try and do the same thing for Greece. It just, just didn't work out for him in Greece. Um, I mean, he's part of how, you know, steam ships, you know, he helped with that. I mean, he was all about the future and looking forward. I mean, the surgery he had that killed him, it was a new surgery, but, you know, he believed in it, even though, you know, it didn't come through for him. Like, he believed in new technology and new stuff. It bit, bit him in the end, you know, but uh, it's, just, it's just a really neat story and everything. And, yeah, if, you, if this is your first time watching, you definitely need to check for it. Check out from the beginning of this video right here because it is amazing. Uh, definitely, I'm so happy I finally got to it. We've done a lot of kind of cool uh, pieces on travel and exploring and stuff like that. This might be the best one, though. I mean, it's not really exploring, but you kind of got to go around the world, and he was pretty crazy. And just the, the battles he's won are just unbelievable. Unbelievable. The tricks up his sleeve, you know, and the tactics he used, and he came out on top basically almost every single time. Uh, I mean, just amazing. Uh, I mean, the praise is well deserved all around the world. All these places apparently praise him, and uh, deservingly so. And I'm very glad at the end there that the the British finally, like you know, you know, came up, came through and acknowledged, you know, what a great you know captain he was, and all that good stuff. And props to them, and just props to him, and props to uh, kings and generals for this amazing series. Like always, oh, always coming on top. But anyways, guys, please hit that like and subscribe button below and hope to catch you guys in future videos. Always a blast here uh, learning new stuff and exploring new adventures and whatnot. But anyways, guys, peace. Catch you guys in future videos. And yeah, I am out of here, guys. Have a great night.